And there you have it, the final meeting of the January 6th committee, at least in public, four criminal referrals of Donald Trump to the Department of Justice, including obstructing an official proceeding, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to make a false statement, and for inciting, assisting, or aiding, or comforting an insurrection. The big question now, Sandra, is what does the Department of Justice do about this? Does it initiate uh, a criminal prosecution of the president? Does it leave it hanging over his head during the entire campaign? Or does it come out and say, we're not going to pursue? Let's ask our legal panel and anchor of the story, Martha McCallum, joining us now as well. Fox News contributors Andy McCarthy, Jonathan Turley are here. So to that point, Jonathan, can you please weigh in on what this means? Obviously, from this day forward, the threat of uh, the president, the former president, being legally blocked from holding office, this could hang over his candidacy unless the DOJ makes it very clear where they stand on this referral. Well, that's always the risk of a referral. First of all, it obviously has no binding effect. But the risk is the Department of Justice could ultimately just reject this and uh, really contradict the claims of many that the criminal conduct here is obvious. It's not obvious. Uh, that this committee again promised that there would be new evidence being displayed today. Uh, there was a couple videos that we had not seen before, but there was no direct new evidence of a, a criminal act uh, by the former president. That's not to say that his conduct wasn't reckless or reprehensible, but that's not a criminal act. And it was basically a rehashing of what we have seen in virtually every one of these hearings, and they simply attach these referrals to it. So the Department of Justice could reject this referral and take it nowhere. Uh, they could also take it to trial and, and look for a favorable uh, jury in places like D.C. The problem is I don't think these convictions on this evidence uh, would likely be, uh, um, uh, would likely withstand judicial scrutiny. The biggest problem are those counts that turn on the president's speech. That speech, in my view, was protected under existing Supreme Court cases like Brandenburg. Uh, it would not meet the standard the Supreme Court has set out for the criminalization of speech. That's my view. But I expect that as, even if they were to eke out a conviction, they'd have a pretty hard time on appeal. So, uh, Martha, what do you think is the bigger impact here? Is that the potential legal impact of this final meeting of the January 6th committee and all the work that it has uh, done in public and behind the scenes up until now? Or is it political impact? And how long could it last? Because between the election, between the last January 6th public hearing, the election and now, it really had kind of faded from view, obviously because of the criminal referrals in this final public meeting. It'll be back in the public eye for some time, but it didn't seem to have a lot of staying power. Well, you know, John, it, their ability to affect anything at this point is political, as far as Congress is concerned. The mm -hmm. legal side of this question is well underway at the Department of Justice, and you've had people, including Bill Barr, say that he wouldn't be surprised to see an indictment based on the work that is now underway by the special counsel, Jack Smith, and his purview is the Mar-a-Lago documents and then, to a certain extent, some of January 6th. So, so all of that work is very much underway. It feels in many ways like this is a political exercise to an extent. Obviously, mm -hmm. they were uh, they were put out as a commission to come forward with a report. That report is final. The whole thing will come out on Wednesday. So that will be part of the public record. And all of this has to happen now, of course, because Republicans are about to take over the House. That will lead to the disbanding of this commission, and their work will be done. And the DOJ will have their work to continue. It's hard to say how much January 6th impacted the midterm elections. We know that abortion was a bigger factor than most people on the Republican side thought it was going to be. How much voters care about these issues at this point? The only way that you can kind of see any expression of that, perhaps, John, is in the candidates that were sort of selected and supported by President Trump. Did, did they, were they hurt in any way because of the connection to all of this? And, and that sort of is one thread that might show you the political implications of this when it comes to voting, which is really the ultimate say on this whole matter. You know, um, Andy, if we could bring you in here. First, just your, your general reaction to what we just heard. Well, I, you know, again, I think not only is the Justice Department, Jonathan mentioned that this is not 
binding and, you know, the Justice Department could reject it. Uh, my sense is the Justice Department will ignore it, which is what the Justice Department generally does when Congress grandstands in this fashion. Um, I, I would just point out the last referral that they made was about uh, incitement and incitement of the violence at the Capitol. Um, the Justice Department has um, prosecuted upwards of 800 people on, in connection with the Capitol riot. Insurrection is a federal crime. They have not brought a single insurrection case against anybody who's been prosecuted. They have taken the position in the most serious cases that they brought in connection with seditious conspiracy that Trump was not an unindicted co-conspirator. And to the extent that the defendants who were charged tried to blame Trump in those cases, the Justice Department took the position that he was basically a pretext for things that these militia-type groups were planning to do anyway. Uh, so the Justice Department, in order to prosecute Trump at this point um, for inciting or aiding and abetting the incitement of the Capitol riot, they would have to completely unwind and reverse the position that they've taken for about two years mm. uh, on these cases. So, and, and the, the other thing about that is the committee knows that. Uh, and yet they don't, they haven't addressed it, they don't address it. Um, you know, in connection with Trump's speech, he took pains in the speech uh, to say that, you know, he wanted them to march peacefully. The fact that the committee doesn't broadcast that he said that doesn't make that go yeah. away. So, you know, again, this is a theatrical exercise more than, you know, a real hearing process. Jonathan, I was following along with you. Uh, you were tweeting while this uh, meeting was happening, huh. and you really focused in and said it was notable that Cheney began this entire discussion of evidence by focusing on Trump's delay in calling supporters to leave the Hill. And you say that focus on inaction versus action is not going to work in their favor. Here was Cheney, uh, Cheney's opening statement, part of it. Among the most shameful of this committee's findings was that President Trump sat in the dining room off the Oval Office watching the violent riot at the Capitol on television. For hours, he would not issue a public statement instructing his supporters to disperse and leave the Capitol despite urgent pleas from his White House staff and dozens of others to do so. So you say this is uh, evidence of inaction, not action. Criminal charges require proof of intent and other elements, and you did not see that mm -hmm. today. Jonathan? Right. As a, yeah, as a criminal defense attorney, I was really struck at how weak this was. Uh, you know, they, they keep on referring to things that might have occurred, appointments that might have been made, letters that might have been sent, but ultimately were not. That's not a compelling case for uh, a criminal prosecution. Many of us were really looking to see if they had anything new that was actually direct. I mean, you've got to keep in mind that within a few weeks, the alleged victim in this case, the House of Representatives, which is representing the people, of course, is going to change. I mean, the new House is going to come in, and they're either going to try to rescind or renounce uh, this referral, which puts the Department of Justice in a curious position. I do think uh, that Andy's right, that the Department will do what it will do regardless of this referral. What we've always said on, on this network, uh, and some of us have emphasized, is that the more serious threat is coming from Mar-a-Lago, not January yeah. 6th. Uh, and I think that's still the case. I think if you if you see this final meeting, you get the feeling of sort of a group of actors that refuse to leave mm -hmm. the stage. I mean, you've got, you know, a, a bunch of folks that are repeating exactly what they have said now in repeated hearings. Mm -hmm. And each time they've they've said we're going to be bringing in some new powerful evidence, and then they repeat it. Um, you need more than that uh, for a prosecution. You need more than mere repetition. Um, I want to direct this to Martha and pull up um, call for number two here, Benny Thompson. You know, when we talk about whether or not the Justice Department is going to give an indication of whether or not it will pursue this, we would be wise to keep in mind what Benny Thompson said here in cut two. Let's listen to this. Never had a president of the United States stir up a violent attempt to block the transfer of power. I believe nearly two years later, this is still a time of reflection and reckoning. 
If we are to survive as a nation of laws and democracy, this can never happen again. You know, Martha, I think you could you could uh, interpret what he didn't say there as as being as long as Donald Trump is a candidate for president of the United States, that threat is still out there. So, what do you think the Department of Justice would do here? Might it actually take up this criminal referral? Might it leave this hanging as a cudgel over over Donald Trump's head to say if he gets anywhere near the presidency, maybe we'll pull the trigger on it again? How do you read all this? Well, obviously, you know, the Department of Justice has been, and the FBI have been sort of swept into these broad um, accusations that they act politically at times and the choices that they make about prosecution. So this is going to be a very sensitive topic for them. And I think in many ways, they would be best to sort of ignore, even to say, you know, we thank you for your referral um, and we appreciate your right to make a referral, Congress, but we are keeping that separate from the investigation, which we've had a, a go going on for quite some time and that's why we have a special counsel now who is the effort being to kind of keep this at a political arm's length from them. There's a lot of suggestions about whether or not this uh, individual Jack Smith w will be completely apolitical. We haven't seen his work yet and we certainly um, hope that he will undertake it obviously in, in, a, in a straightforward way. One of the things that Congress can do though John is the Electoral Count Act. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's one area where they might be wise to put their focus. And they talk about making it a rider in this uh, final budget bill but before the end of this week um, to try to clarify some of these things, because that is the point that was made both by Liz Cheney and by Benny Thompson, that this is the first time in the history of the country that we've seen a president try to halt the process of moving from the president who was in office to the president who has been elected. And that is something that Congress could do if they can get their heads together on it. Really interesting. We're getting reaction from some of the lawmakers that are involved with the ethics referral, uh, including Jim Jordan. Uh, he's just put out a statement that we received through Chad Pergram, who will join us in just a few moments on Capitol Hill, saying this is just another partisan and political stunt made by a select committee that knowingly altered evidence, blocked minority representation on a committee for the first time in the history of the U.S. House of Representatives, and failed to respond to Mr. Jordan's numerous letters and concerns surrounding the politicization and legitimacy of the committee's work. Your response, Jonathan Turley. Well, I think that that's sort of baked in, right, is, is that this the needle hasn't moved. Uh, despite this focus of the J6 committee, these highly produced videos, uh, the repetition, the, the reading from these prompters, the producer they brought in, it, it really is singing to the choir. And so you're not going to have much of a change here on how people view this. Polls have indicated that the public views this as a riot, uh, as an insurrection, but it doesn't mean that they don't condemn the people responsible, including President Trump, uh, that many people feel acted recklessly. And many of us criticized the Trump speech while it was being given. But this is a question of whether that constitutes a crime. And what we saw today uh, does not create that basis. Now, whether Jack Smith will have some new evidence, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, but if I were defense counsel for President Trump, my eyes would still remain fixed on Mar-a-Lago. I, I just don't see this as, a, as, as much of a threat of something that could be actually defended uh, at trial or on appeal. Uh, Jonathan, Andy, Martha, stand by. We're going to take a quick break here. On, on the other side, would a Democratic White House really seek to prevent a former Republican president from seeking public office ever again? We'll be right back. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.